Welcome everybody to Cooperstown, New York, site of the latest virtual Voices of the Game program. We're very glad you could all join us today for a special virtual Voices of the Game. Uh, my name is Bruce Markison from the Hall of Fame's Education Department. It's my pleasure and privilege to talk to Steve Blass. Steve won 103 games during a 10-year career with the Pittsburgh Pirates. He was one of the National League's top pitchers in both 1971 and 72 later becoming a beloved broadcaster for the Pirates, uh, served as both a radio and TV broadcaster in 1983 until his retirement until 2019. And we would be remiss if we did not mention that Steve was recently named to the new Hall of Fame for the Pittsburgh Pirates. So he is part of their inaugural class. Steve, it's a pleasure as always to talk to you. Welcome to the program. How are you? I'm doing very, very good, Bruce. I've uh, been looking forward to this uh, Anything having to do with uh, both the Hall of Fame and Roberto Clemente is, uh, is a treat for me. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, both of those entities, Roberto and the Hall. Well, we're certainly a fan of Clemente and we're a fan of you as well. And before we get into the subject of Roberto, I do want to talk a little bit about your recent induction into the Pirates Hall of Fame. Uh, you go in with some great company, Clemente, Mazeroski, Stargell, Wagner, Dave Parker, a number of others part of the inaugural class. I'm curious, Steve, did you know this was happening in advance or was this a complete surprise to you? Uh, well, Bruce, uh, when, uh, when I retired, they had a wonderful night for me at uh, BNC Park. And part of, the, uh, part of the program was the announcement that they were going to have finally a, a, a Pittsburgh Pirate Hall of Fame and that I was gonna be in the inaugural class. Uh, and then we had two years of pandemic, so uh, it, uh, just came to uh, be that uh, we had it this past uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, so I had uh, two years, I guess, to, to get used to the idea. But yeah. when when I finally got to the event, uh, it just it was so special. And I was just blown away and so darn proud to be a, a Pittsburgh Pirate and uh, have all these 60 years with the organization. But then I looked at that list and I was a little intimidated. I said, what am I doing? What is my name doing on that list? So it was a little intimidating when, when I saw the, uh, the names of Honus Wagner and the Wainers and Pi Trainer and, and all these guys that, uh, that have such, such great careers. Uh, honored to be a part of that group to, to, to the max. And uh, it was a wonderful celebration. I was able to bring my family in from Connecticut and uh, it was just, so darn special and uh, I'm, I'm very honored, uh, yet a little intimidated still, but a very, very wonderful day uh, for, for Pittsburgh Pirate Baseball. Well, it's certainly understandable given what you've done both as a pitcher and as a broadcaster. You have been associated with the Pirate franchise for numerous decades. So I think when you take into account both the broadcasting and playing, uh, to me, there's no doubt uh, you're deserving of the Pirates Hall of Fame. Take us back to the ceremony on September the 3rd. Did you all give induction speeches? How did that go? Well, uh, yeah, there was a, a, a class of, of 19. Uh, there were 12 from the, the, the big Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, obviously. That would be the first, uh, first group. There were four from the Negro League teams, the Crawfords and the Grays. And then there was just three of us living actually out of the 19, uh, uh, Dave Parker, Bill Mazeroski and myself. So uh, they were wonderful giving me the honor of, of speaking on behalf of, of the group in entirety. And then I was able to say uh, some things that I felt about uh, the guys that were with me, Dave Parker and, uh, and Maz. And uh, I, I have to tell you about the Parker situation because I said, uh, it's great to be here with Dave Parker. Dave, uh, all they did was ask you to replace Roberto Clemente, <laughs> that's all. And all you did was take ownership of right field and play right field as big as you could possibly play it, especially under the white hot lights of all-star competition and World Series in 1979. And uh, it was just great to be able to talk to him and tell him how much I enjoyed playing him. He was a big man and he played that position so big. And then to talk about Maz, of course, who uh, uh, it's just, I, I think Bill Mazeroski represents all the good things about the game of baseball. True professional, uh, played second base uh, probably better than anybody I think that ever played. And uh, he was just a, a marvelous guy to, to learn from. He's the ultimate professional. I, I learned so much uh, 
uh, from Bill as a rookie. He told me, he said, hey, you're in the big leagues now. People, no excuses, no excuses. People don't want, they don't care why you didn't. They want to know why you did. But just little subtleties. When He didn't say much, but when Maz spoke, uh, if, you, if you listened, you learned, you learned. And uh, he's, he's one of the great people that I've ever run across in the game. Bill Mazeroski is a Hall of Famer. And he was very helpful to Dave Cash, the guy who replaced him at second base in the early 70s. One final question about the Hall of Fame. Is it, is it a physical Hall of Fame? Is it attached to a pirate museum? Tell us about that. Well, there, there's a section out by the Clemente Gate and by the Clemente Statue. There's a, there's a wall that was blank and uh, the, the plaques of the 19 of us have been put on that wall. And that's where we had the actual ceremony of, of uh, family and, and friends and, and the three of us, Bill and, and Dave and his family uh, and uh, Karen and I and, and, uh, and the rest of our family. Uh, it was uh, it was just a, a great setting. So there's not an actual room at this point. The plaques are up on that wall. One of the great things, Bruce, was the night before the ceremony, uh, they invited the inductees, the three of us and our families and a lot of other families. Uh, like I had a chance to meet the great granddaughter of Honus Wagner. I mean, how good is that? You know that name constantly and, and you know everything about it, but then you can attach the name and the history to some actual fem family members and talk to them, uh, Ralph Kiner's two sons. It was just great to, to catch up with them. And I, I had met them uh, in New York when Ralph was doing, of course, the, uh, the, the, the Mets games, uh, but various members of, of the families, uh, Willie Stargell's uh, wife, uh, Margaret, and her twin sister, who was a broadcaster in Wilmington, North Carolina. So that bought those iconic names into being just by being with, with uh, members of their family. So that was one of the great, great highlights that I, I didn't know was gonna affect me so much, but I drove home thinking, yeah, now I can connect names with actual real people. And it was just a nice bridge. It was a wonderful bridge. Sounds like a great evening in Pittsburgh. To give some background on Steve Blass, he was born in Canaan, Connecticut, from my understanding, a rural area, a uh, proud son of a plumber and yep. uh, went into athletics instead. Uh, your first spring training, Steve, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, was 1964. Of course, today first spring training was actually not 1961. 61. I, I, yeah, and then I came to the Pirates in 64. But a story about that uh, 1961 spring training, uh, I was among a bunch of minor league inductees, and the Pirates had just won the world championship the year before. So we were in the back room at Terry Park in Fort Myers where the Pirates trained. And all we dared do was look around the corner. Oh, there's Maz. Oh, there's Elroy Face. There's, there's Bill Verdon. And it was, I, was at, I was just out of high school still. I was 18 years old. And I went to a major league spring training that, that uh, first year in 1961. And what an introduction to what a, a major league team was all about in spring training. So when I finally got to... Uh, having a chance that I might make the team. I had had some experience because I, I uh, had gone to that first spring training. And, and just one other quick story. We ran out of, we ran out of pitchers on a, on a road trip over to Fort Lauderdale to play the Yankees because mm -hmm. that's what we did. You want all kind of pitchers. And Mickey Mantle didn't start the game. And we ran out of pitchers and they had me warming up. I came in from the bullpen and they were all said, we want Mickey, we want Mickey. <laughs> and I'm 18 years old. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't want to use any bad language, but, you know, it's hard to throw strikes to Mickey Mantle when you've got bathroom issues, <laughs> when you're trying to throw the strikes. It was an incredible experience. All he did was screw the top of his helmet back on because I didn't come close to the plate. But I will never forget spring training 1961 in Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> That's great. So, Steve, was it that spring training that you first met Roberto Clemente or was it later on? Well, I, I had seen him. I'd flown out to Pittsburgh with my dad and my high school coach and then our scout, Bob Whalen, who was a wonderful scout. And uh, I, so I was in the clubhouse just before I was warming up down the right field bullpen uh, to hope that they would sign me, which they did. Uh, so I had seen him with uh, spring training 1961, where I really had a chance to look at him and watch him. And I, like everybody else, I couldn't take my eyes off him. It, all through the rest of my career with the Pirates, I could not take my eyes off him when he's performing. He was, he was, you, you didn't want to miss a thing he did. So uh, yeah, he, I, I watched him a lot uh, in, in spring training as, as an 18 year old. It was, 
it was just a, a, whole, a marvelous to be that young uh, and go into a major league clubhouse that had just won the World Series. I mean, it's just, uh, it, was, it was a wonderful thing. You didn't have much in common at that point. Uh, you know, he's no. a, an established veteran. He's just rounding into superstardom. You're a young kid. Uh, he's black and Latino uh, from Puerto Rico. You're white from rural Connecticut. Yeah, uh, a lot, a lot of opposites there. Did it take a long time for you and him to really click and become friends? Yeah, it it did, and it but but it started then. And you know, I, I'm I'm 80 now, and I, I look back a lot. Uh, reflections and and I say how good how how good was it that the planets aligned I'm, I'm an eight you know I'm from a small town in Connecticut he's from Puerto Rico and I get to spend all these years watching him and as a teammate uh, and eventually giving a eulogy at, at his memorial uh, how lucky how lucky I have been in this whole thing and Clemente is such a, a, a big part of it because uh you know, I, I got to watch the best on a daily basis, but to take, uh, I, I was, I was like every other young pirate minor leaguer or, or rookie with a big league team. I had him on such a pl plateau because all us young pirates, we watched him and we felt like we had to validate our, our worth to be okay, to be a teammate of his. Cause we had him up on this pedestal, uh, all of them on that, uh, on the pirate team that, on the varsity, uh, but him in, in particular, because he had a presence, you know, major leaguers have a presence of their own, but then I think there's another level. And Clemente was that level because you didn't want to miss anything he did on the field. And when he spoke, you, you had an awareness that this guy was aware of the world around him, not just the baseball world. And that just grew and grew and grew as the years went on. So I had a chance to start experiencing that when I was 18 years old. And I look back and, and, and again, feel so lucky because you learn by watching and listening. You keep your mouth shut and your eyes and ears open. Uh, you, you, you get pretty good education. In fact, when I speak now, I go out, I, I talk about that team that I joined in 1964. I never went to college. Heck, I couldn't have got in. But I went to the University of Baseball and people like Clemente and Stargell and Mass were my professors. And uh, that was one heck of a school. So initially, Steve, you didn't want to approach him. It took a while. Absolutely, because you feel like you want to validate it. You're good enough to be on his team and teammates. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I didn't. I, I said very little uh, to him uh, as a rookie because I wanted to. I wanted to let him know that I was good enough to be a teammate, and I felt that way about that whole pirate team that had the world championship uh, four years before that. So. Yeah, and I tell a story uh, that uh, when, I, uh, when I really got to know him pretty well enough, uh, I went over to his locker one time and I said, Roberto, here's the deal. If I ever get traded, I'm going to pitch you inside because every national pitcher pitches you away and you get 350 every year. And he said, Blas, I'm going to tell you one thing. You pitch me inside, I will hit the ball to Harrisburg. I said, okay, good talk. And I slunk back into my locker. <laughs> but we had him on that pedestal. And you really did want to validate that you were good enough to be on his team. teammate. But then how about this? When you're on, on, the, on the mound pitching and you've got Roberto Clemente in right field, I'm just saying, hit the ball in that direction. I'll go get a sandwich. When I come back, you'll be out. And then I took in the bigger picture. I got Clemente in right field. Mazeroski, a Hall of Famer at second base, Willie Stargell, Hall of Famer at first base. So I did, when I pitched right-handers, I pitched them away a lot because that was a pretty good threesome to, to uh, have a chance to handle the ball. So it, uh, it was just, it just evolved uh, with, the, with the ball club itself. But Clemente in particular was just always fascinating. I, I, I couldn't take my eyes off. Steve, once you became familiar with Clemente, you becoming friends, what was he like? Tell us about his personality. Was he talkative? Was he quiet? Sense of humor? Give us a sense of that. Well, he, he was a lot of things. Uh, personality wise, uh, he was quite contained. He never wanted to be embarrassed. I think uh, having English be the second language of his had something to do with that because he's so bright. Uh, he was aware uh, of, of everything around that clubhouse. Uh, I, I used to watch him when people would come in and if it was maybe somebody of a national nature, he was very good, very, very professional, but I thought he was extremely, extremely sensitive when a kid would come in, 
because that's an intimidating environment. And Clemente would get up out of his chair in his locker if he saw the kid come over and knowing that that was, you know, is totally intimidating. He would spend time with that kid because uh, he, he had a, that sensitivity about him. So uh, I learned from that. You know, you, you watch that and, you're, and, and it taught me how to try to be that way. Uh, but he, he, he knew who was in that clubhouse all the time, all the time. And the sensitivity of, uh, for example, a guy, we got Jackie Hernandez uh, late. And, and he knew that Jackie was not going to be a Hall of Famer. But he, because of that, he related to him all the time, encouragement. And, uh, and then Jackie Hernandez winds up recording the last out of the 71 series when Earl Weaver said you couldn't win a World Series with Jackie Hernandez at shortstop. And, but Clemente had time for him before that. And uh, if, if somebody was, was having a, a tough time, uh, uh, he, he was sensitive. He, was, uh, he always carried himself well-dressed, I mean, this guy could have been a movie star. He's good looking, well-dressed. Uh, uh, he looked like he was 25 years old when he died at 38. Mm. Uh, everybody looked at that, but there was, he wasn't the healthiest guy. I mean, he'd gone through malaria. He went through a car wreck that he got T-boned. And, and I, still, I still think part of the reason he did all this with his neck maybe was lingering effects of that, of that car wreck. So, uh, and he did have, he did have this, awareness of the world around but one of his favorite quotes that i always remembered was i relate to people who struggle <laughs> and i don't want to try to paraphrase the, the the accent but i he said i want to relate to the people who struggle other people are good they can take care of themselves but i want to i want to do things for those people and that's why i still think had he lived or was still living uh you know, a governorship of puerto rico would not have been out of reach. I, I really believe that. Uh, and I probably should more about the politics of Puerto Rico than I do, but he had that presence and the intelligence and the clout. I mean, think of the clout he has had on all the Latino players coming to the big leagues. They all, they all revere Clemente. They all revere him. Many of them were 21. I agree with you. I think he would have pursued a political career. A lot of people have talked about him being a manager, but I think he had a higher calling. I think he would have gone into politics and who, now, who knows how high he might have risen in that hierarchy in, in Puerto Rico. What about his sense of humor? Was he a guy that you could joke around with? You obviously have always had a great sense of humor. You like to play pranks. The Pirates had a lot of pranksters. Would you guys dare to play pranks on Clemente? I, I did when I got to know him and, and got to be friends. And, and I don't want to say he was his best friend. We both had friends that we were closer to, but we got, we got a, a pretty good relation going and in fact, Bruce, I, I will say the last five years of my major league career, one of my goals was to, to, to get Clemente to laugh or smile. I mean, cause I, I, I thought it was my goal. I enjoyed it. He enjoyed it. Uh, there was an old TV show called mission impossible. And when he got his neck work on before every game, he had, a, he had a routine. Uh, there were a couple of times I would get under the table and I would try to be the mission impossible guy that went into the telephone booth and got his assignment, you know, good morning. And I would say, good morning, Mr. Clemente. This is your neck. Uh, your assignment today, should you accept it, would be to double three times off Jack Billingham and throw two guys out at third base. And he'd be up on the trainer's table. And he'd be giggling and laughing. And uh, so we, we, we did that a couple of times. And his routine was so absolute that he would go through this thing of getting Tony Bartram, our trainer, to stretch him out and work on his neck, that he had it down where he could get off that trainer's table in his, in his underwear, get in that uniform and be out when they started the anthem. Well, I stole his uniform out of, all his uniforms out of his locker one night. It was on the table. So he got off the table, ran in, there's no uniform. And I think it was the only time in the history of the Pittsburgh Pirates that the anthem was played with no right fielder. I absolutely believe that to be the truth. And he said some words to me after that, that I can't repeat. I know what he said, but I can't repeat them. But, and we laughed about it, but uh, uh, it, it was, it was a joy because he's such a good looking guy and to, to get him to, to, to see him smile and laugh. Uh, it was just uh, something that I really, I really enjoyed doing. Did he ever retaliate with a prank of his own against you or other guys? No, he was, he was, no, he was pretty straight about that kind of stuff. Yeah. But he would get he would get involved in the banter in our clubhouse because it was just so irreverent. Yeah. And it, it was because we we're good. So when you when you're good, you can have fun in the clubhouse. When you when you stink, 
there shouldn't be much fun in the clubhouse, but we we were a good ball club in those those handful of years. And Justy would say something in Italian, and Roberto would answer in, in Spanish, and then Doc Ellis would say he didn't understand either one of them. There was screaming and hollering back, but there was there was great per personal respect, and you can't have that kind of bantering unless there is a lot of respect and unless you're good. So he would he would get involved in that, and sometimes he'd hoot and holler. Uh, so it. it it was it was a happy it was a happy clubhouse because it was a good clubhouse and yeah. uh, the, you know the the, the the all the things I, I I remember about the early years and then it just it just was it just got better and better until we lost him yeah for a good part of his career Clemente's manager was Danny Murtaugh he was also your manager for quite a while my understanding has always been that early on this was particularly. I guess late 50s, early 60s, they didn't really get along that well. Murtaugh felt that Clemente complained too much about his injuries. He didn't really like that. But then at some point, the relationship changed and they, they really did develop a mutual respect. Uh, a, is that true? And B, what was their relationship like when you joined the Pirates? Well, you know, uh, I joined the Pirates in 64, so Roberto had been around a while, and I heard those stories. I, I heard about uh, um, not playing unless uh, he was absolutely healthy and that sort of thing. But I, uh, one of his favorite quotes, too, and he said it with some intensity all the time. He said, I, I'm going to tell you one thing, a hypochondriac cannot produce. And that was a mantra of his. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if, if he didn't didn't play because he didn't feel exactly 100%. It had to happen before I got there because I never saw it. I, I never saw it. And I watched him like a hawk. And uh, so uh, personalities, uh, it's, it's hard to get in somebody else's uh, personalities, uh, differences. Uh, if they existed, uh, they got over. They got, they got over it. When I was there, it, it, was, it was good. It was, it was really good. So, Did you uh, sense that Murtaugh understood how important he was to the clubhouse yeah i, I think so and, and, and flat out production too uh you know he needed clemente to be uh, uh, feel good about his value to the ball club and i i think it evolved uh, if it, if it wasn't there you know it may not have been as much as it was related uh that that the differences but but i did hear that stuff uh, yeah, you could not help if you're Danny Murtaugh being perceptive. And Danny Murtaugh was perceptive about players. Uh, yeah, it, uh, it, had to, it had to evolve in such a way that, that, that there was the mutual respect and, and admiration uh, because it's, that, that's all I saw. That's all I saw. Yeah. And a quick, quick story about Murtaugh being perceptive about players. Doc Ellis announced to all of us in the clubhouse once he had he had an issue with Danny Murtaugh and he was going to go get it squared away. And Doc got was all puffed up. And as he marched it, we followed so we could be outside the door in case the screaming and hollering. Up. Well, there was silence. Then Doc finally came out after 10 minutes and said, we said, well, what would you say? What you what did you say? He said, I, I don't I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not really sure why I went in there. <laughs> so Danny Murtaugh knew how to handle people. Yeah, and uh, yeah. he was he was to the point Danny was to the point where if he was upset with anybody he would have a clubhouse meeting you know how clubhouse managers can come in after games and just start throwing in there all that stuff and hollering well Danny would would he wouldn't holler too much but he 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 rev it up a little bit and then when he's getting ready to make his last statement we were all sitting there he would he would say something about the way we were playing that needed change but as he was saying it he saw it he would kind of roll his eyes all around us and we would all, and then he'd leave. And he, and so we didn't know who he was directing his remarks to because he'd make that circle while he's giving us the, his last salvo and he'd go into his club, he'd go into his office. And say, was that about me? Was that, what do you, what do you mean? So, so Murtaugh was very perceptive. He, uh, he was, he was just a joy to play for. And if you were doing his job, your job with Danny Murtaugh, uh, you didn't have to worry about how he's going to come into the, into the ballpark, how he's going to be on a given night, say maybe as opposed to a Billy Martin. If you were doing your job, you really didn't hear from Danny. Yeah. If you weren't doing your job, you heard from him emphatically. And I'm sure Clemente was, he, he, it was no different with Clemente. Steve, let's talk about another relationship, Clemente and Willie Stargell, kind of the two Hall of Fame bookends in the outfield for a while. Stargell eventually moved to first base 
How close were Roberto and Willie? I think they were very close. I think there was a mutual respect about abilities. And, and, and I think Roberto had a, a, a lot of affection and respect about Willie Stargell, a younger player, and his evolving into such a mature uh, a, a presence on our ball club and, and, and such a, a great ambassador in, in so many ways and the way he dealt with the media and the way he dealt with everybody. And, you know, one other thing, when, when Willie was in left field, you had two of the best arms in baseball. Clemente was quicker, maybe more accurate, uh, but Willie was played left field at Forbes Field, 365 down the left field line. And he would go up, down in that corner and he, he would make it interesting coming right over the top with a four seamer and make it interesting for guys trying to stretch a single into a double. He had a great overhand uh, uh, delivery and it wasn't as quick as, as Clemente, but you, you saw, uh, uh, I can only imagine how it was and it was for a brief time that you had Clemente and Burden and Stargell and an outfield that uh, was pretty hard to beat. But those two arms were, were magnificent. Clemente was so much fun to watch play because it was like his playing right field was choreographed. When I came up as a rookie, before I started, I spent a little time down in the right field bullpen, which in Forbes Field was about a foot and a half from, from the foul line. And so I, if you can visualize sitting uh, on a bench down that right field line, about you know tucked back into that corner and watch Clemente in back of you get a ball and wind up throwing it toward home over your head. So you look straight up and straight, straight out. He would get the ball and throw it over part of the stands in right field to home plate. I mean, that's just beautiful stuff. <laughs> Those people in that first few rows of, of down the first baseline, um, they had a treat. They could look straight up at a Clemente throw instead of having to look way out in the outfield. Yeah. And there's one other aspect about uh, as a young player, and this, this I, I, I didn't know what was going on at first, and it, re, it was in regard to Clemente, was I was in the low minor leagues. When we would uh, have drills in the minor league camps, they would say, if you ever get to Pittsburgh, if you ever get to good enough to uh, play in the big leagues for the Pirates, we're going to tell you what you're going to do when there is a base hit, ground ball, or, or line drive to right field in Forbes Field. You're going to go over between home plate and first base and be ready for a, an errant throw from Clemente because they would round first on a single and he would throw behind them. And they said, if you ever get to Pittsburgh, you better be there for a backup for a ball that might get away. I said, I'm going to, I'm going to back. There's going to, might be a wild throw between first and home on a single. I, I didn't understand, but then they explained it. And it was absolutely the truth because we saw a time again where those guys would take a big turn and he'd throw behind them. And if, uh, every once in a while it would backfire where they wouldn't try to get back to first, but they'd carry on to second. And mm. It didn't work very often, but I see, I saw him pick a lot of guys off. Did he ever overthrow the first baseman and hit you? No, not once, no. not once. But I, I made sure I got my butt over there because yeah. <laughs> I was a young guy trying to keep a job. Sure. I know it's been a long time, Steve, but I'm curious during games or maybe even pregame workouts did Clemente and Stargell did they talk to each other a lot were they oh, oh yeah. were they hanging around together much uh yeah we we, we didn't see him we all kind of went our separate ways after games but yeah they're yeah yeah I yeah they were good friends they they, they were you, you just had a sense of it that that it was all good uh, you, you overheard them talking and and, and yeah it, it was good but before let me tell you about before games because Clemente was like every other position player he thought he could pitch Every position, but of course, we all thought, you know, all us pitchers thought we could be rock and roll singers too. So anyway, just, just as much chance of either one. So Roberto on occasion would say, Blast, come here. I want to show you this breaking ball I can throw. I, could, I can do this. I can pitch. Yeah. And he'd throw, and it was awful. And I said, Roberto, keep your day job. You know, it's going to work out for you. All right. You're going to be fine. You're, yeah, yeah. You're, you're going to be around for a while. So it was terrible curveball. <laughs> but he also said, okay, but Blast, you remember you cannot ever swing my bat. You can use it to bunt with, but don't ever swing and break my bat. I, I will hunt you down, kill you and your family. And, and he said it in perfectly good English. <laughs> Final question, Steve, on Stargell. Did you get the sense that Roberto realized that when Clemente stepped aside and initially we thought it would be through a normal retirement, not through tragic circumstances, 
But did you get the sense that Clemente looked at Stargell as kind of the successor, as the leader of the team? Yeah, that yeah. That dynamic evident. Yeah, there, there, Willie had a presence too as he evolved. He was a big man. Uh, they called him Pops, uh, you know, affectionately. But you, you could see the maturation of, of Willie Stargell and, and Clemente of Brighter. Because if he looked around that clubhouse, first of all, none of the rest of us would ever have a chance to, 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 to evolve that way. But yeah. Willie did. Willie had a presence. Uh, yeah, it, it wound up that Willie, he would, he would, uh, he would speak uh, uh, politically. He would. Uh, I, I remember him introducing some some uh, 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 classical music presentations. Uh, so uh, yeah, Willie, Willie got to be the only the only mistake I ever saw Willie make. And we we test him because he was a wine connoisseur. So we set up a wine, uh, wine tasting test and, and had him evaluate it. And of course, we got some watermelon wine as one of the three bottles and they were all you know, wrapped and so he couldn't tell. And he voted that the watermelon wine was the best of the three and the other three cost $75 a bottle. So we, we did catch him one time, but that was early on in his career. <laughs> we didn't want to test him that way again. Our guest is Steve Blass, uh, former ace of the Pittsburgh Pirates, longtime broadcaster. We are celebrating Roberto Clemente Day here at the Hall of Fame and also at PNC Park, where Steve is today doing this show. Uh, when we look back at um, the career of Clemente, some of the imagery is fantastic. And I wanted to point out uh, whether, I don't, I don't know if it's a photo or a painting behind you of Clemente. Could you tell us a little bit about that, Steve? What is that exactly? Uh the, um, oh, oh, in the back of me. Yes, yeah. that that was taken in Fort Myers, and the. Uh, so it's a photo, not a painting. Yeah, it is a photo. Yeah, and it's and it's perfectly placed that the cloud formation in back of him, almost like angels' wings. Oh yeah. So that's that's the the that's the big thing about that picture, and at the Clemente Museum, which is just an absolute treasure. In, in Pittsburgh, that's hanging right as you walk into the museum itself in a, in a larger frame. Yeah. But uh, uh, you know, he, he's he's off his feet. I mean, you you can't you can't orchestrate that. You can't you can't uh, pose that shot. And it's just it happened to be caught, and it's just so darn famous. Uh, it's, I've it's, seen that photo, and my yeah. understanding is it's not been doctored at all. That's my understanding also. And yeah, uh, yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dwayne Reeder, who is the, the curator and the man that has created the Clemente Museum and has done a fabulous job with it, uh, is, is, is says that that that, that catches Clemente uh, and, and maybe every essence of uh, that you could imagine. One of the more interesting but also tragic incidents that had a connection to the pirates in the late 60s, the assassination of Martin Luther King. It occurred April 4th, 1968 just before the scheduled start of the regular season. Uh, Pirate General Manager Joe Brown had actually agreed to cancel the final spring training game, which was against the Yankees, but he was unable to postpone the first two regular season games against Houston, which had been the request of the Pirate players. They did not want to play those games. He said he couldn't do that without permission from the Astros management. The Astros were kind of hesitant on that. You and the rest of the Pirate players were not satisfied with that response, and you basically voted to hold firm on the decision not to play those first two games, April 8th and 9th. Is it true that Clemente and Don Clendenin, seen here, Don Clendenin was a personal friend of Dr. Martin Luther King. Is it true that these two guys were really the leaders in this effort not to play the games? Yes, they were, they were very vocal, as was Maury Wills. Uh, who, 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 with us at the time, and uh, yeah, it, uh, it it was a no-brainer to act as a group uh, when when those guys were emphatic about it. Uh, who are we going to say? Who's going to challenge that? Uh, that was that was the clout on 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 the team, and uh, it was the easiest thing to do was to be firm about that. Absolutely, that was uh, that was never in question. Never the compromise that Joe Brown offered was this, the team would not play either Monday or Tuesday, but then would play on Wednesday, April the 10th, which originally was a travel date. And I guess you guys had a clubhouse meeting and unanimously everybody went along with that. 
Yeah, yeah. We uh, uh, the, we had we had made the point that we wanted to make. So uh, yeah, yeah. We yeah, yeah. It was uh, it was the easiest thing to do. There's a great quote attributed to you, and I'm sure you remember saying this. When you were asked about this whole situation, um, this is what you said. We were white. We felt the same way about Dr. King as the black players did. We were all part of the whole experience. The vote was easy because there was equal representation of white and black players, if not more so, with the emphasis on the high profile guys like Stargill, Clemente, and Maury Wills, whom you mentioned. But you didn't have to be black or white to be aware of doing the right thing and respecting the whole situation. That's the quote that you delivered. And it's really reflective of the attitude of those pirate teams. They were so racially unified, even though you know half the clubhouse was white, the other half black and Latino. It's remarkable. Yeah, that, that it was, and I, I didn't remember uh, being <laughs> being that expressive, but I'm, I'm glad that I can hear that and 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 look, look back on that because Martin Luther King was not just a championship champion of, of black people either. Uh, I think he, Martin Luther King cared about everybody. And so everybody uh, needed to, to care about Martin Luther King. A ab absolutely. And uh, you know, I uh, come, coming from a, a little lily white town of, of 800, 1500 people in Connecticut, I got an education coming up through the minor leagues, playing with Willie Stargell, the black guys, Latino guys. And so I, I learned and, and uh, I, I learned what they were facing because you know that back that I signed in 1960 so uh, you know that uh, that wasn't that long ago but it kind of was a long time ago and and I saw that even in the minor league spring training we had to live in one section of town and the black guys had to live in another section of town we had a bus that went to the white section then the black section took us all to have a breakfast at a restaurant because we that's where we had to eat but uh, we were on one side of town and, and Willie Stargell, Hall of Famer and, and other great black players and, and great people were on the other side of town. And uh, it was part of my continuing education to see that and, 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 and live through it and, and, and go to different uh, minor league towns and go to different hotels and play to stay and places to stay. Um, you do, learn. Do you remember when that segregation in spring training, when that finally came to an end, about when? Well, uh, no, I know that I was in it uh, in, in those years of spring training when you got sent down from the major league camp, you went over to the minor league camp. Uh, it, it was, uh, that was in 60, 61, 62. Uh, that, that's when that took place. And I don't know when it ended, but uh, it, was, it was in your face. It was right in your face. One thing we should mention, Don Clendenin had gone to, I believe it was Morehouse College. And his advisor there was a, a young Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So King was a family friend and was an advisor to Clendenin. And that was uh, certainly another factor in this uh, story as well. And by the Talk way, Don, Clend Don Clendenin could have probably been a, a pro in baseball, football, or basketball. Just a, a gifted, gifted athlete. Yeah, nicknamed the Big Train. 1971, in many ways, signature season for Clemente, but also kind of a signature season for you. Roberto was 36, so not in what you would normally consider your baseball prime, but he hit 341, he slugged 502, and finished fifth in the MVP voting. This was also one of your two best seasons. You went 15 and eight, 2.85 ERA, and a lot of people don't realize this, and I'd forgotten this, you finished second in the Cy Young voting to Steve Carlton, who was all world that year. <laughs> so if not for Carlton, you would have won the, the Cy Young. An incredible season how uh, it both came together for both of you, but you were still young. Clemente was older. And as you mentioned earlier, it's like his body, although he had injuries, his body didn't seem to age like normal players. Uh, absolutely. And, uh, <clears throat> that continued into 72 also. Uh, yes, 71 was, was, was interesting just on, on a personal basis because I didn't know I had finished second to Carlton in the Cy Young voting until I signed my contract for the next year. I didn't have an agent. I, I just know we had a lot of fun, won the World Series. <laughs> that, uh, so it uh, might, might have cost me 8 or $9 perhaps, but uh, yeah. uh, 
uh, the, it, it, you know, the, the magic of, of a World Series year when you start in spring training, you play 30 games and 162 games and playoff and then World Series. Uh, you, 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 yeah, the, the money's good. It's, it's unbelievable now. But you, you think back on that, how many of us are still alive and, and what a joy it was to go through that with, with that group of players and accomplish that. I, I look at my World Series ring. I, I've got it here somewhere. Yeah, and and I, I I look at the thing I look at that and I see the players and the friends that aren't alive anymore. That uh, you know, the, the Danny Murtos and Clemenes and Stargell and and Bob Moose and Doc Ellis and and uh, you know diff, different people and and uh, it just takes you back to going through that whole journey with them and and uh, watching you know watching everybody and, and continuing to watch Clemente do do his magic and. Uh, that that World Series itself was that was his showcase. That where that was where everybody in the baseball world finally had a chance to see what we'd been watching for 20, 20 years in Pittsburgh. And here was a guy that looked like he's 25 at, at the age of 36. Absolutely looked like he's 20, built like a 25-year-old, uh, good looking like a 25-year-old. And uh uh, I, I'm looking at a screen now. I'm seeing him uh, maybe of an image sliding into third base. Another aspect, everything he did in the outfield was smooth and choreographed. But when he ran the bases, he galloped. He galloped. He always got there in time. But it was such a difference from the from the beauty and the smoothness of the way he played right field. So when we knew he had a chance for a triple, it was just so much fun to watch him gallop around you know that we have, we've had guys that have long strides and we've had uh, guys that are quick and short strides but there was it was one okay here's something that's not quite perfect but he always he always got there in time his arms were kind of flapping around oh yeah there, was, there was a lot of there was a lot of movement waste, it wasn't wasted energy but there was a lot of peripheral energy going on yeah but a lot of moving parts but then yeah. if you trailed him around he cut the corners perfectly. He didn't take wide turns. So he was efficient, but he was like a colt <laughs> running around. And uh, you know, Bruce, I, I want to go back because I talk about him running the base for one second. Uh, Manny Sanguin adored and still adores uh, the, 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 the remembrance of, of Roberto Clemente. R Roberto had so much time for Manny. There was a night in Houston where Manny Sanguin who was a wild base runner. He didn't stop until he scored or they tagged him out. So Clemente, after the game, gets a cardboard box and a scalpel and takes us into the clubhouse, in, into the trainer's room. And Roberto Clemente does a clinic on Sanguian base running 101. So he's got the scalpel. And I don't know if you remember some of the Caterpillar tractors, heavy equipment, they, have, they don't have a steering wheel. They have levers that go back and forth, front and back. So he cut two, uh, slots in the top of the cardboard box and took tongue depressors and he showed us how uh, how Sanguine would run to first and he turns and they put he's pulls it back to the right and he spent 20 minutes and it was hilarious watching him describe with a cardboard box and two tongue depressors how many Sanguine run the bases so he I wanted to touch on that sense of humor because I'd forgotten about that so he had his moments and he just had us in absolute stitches because it was a little out of character for him. But it was one of those gems. It was one of those gems. Now, in that World Series, he hits 414. He hits two home runs. He makes two incredible throws. He didn't throw anybody out, but one, he made a close play that should not. And the other was kind of a deterrent to Mark Belanger, who was rounding third. He ended up not scoring in that game. Of all the plays that Clemente became involved in that series, is there one for you that still stands out as most memorable? Well, the, the throw he made from right field over to Richie Hebner at third base, uh, was, was, I think that might have been one described. And it, it, I think it should have been a called out, but he was just, he was remarkably consistent. You know, he went, he hits a couple of home runs. I want to, I want to tell you about one of the home runs he hit in one of the early games of the series, because that series in some places, was billed as a matchup of the, of the two great right fielders, Clemente and Frank Robinson, Hall of Famers. It was billed that way. So early in the game, Clemente hits a home run, and you can see this at the very tail end of the World Series highlight film. Robinson's playing right field, and Clemente hits the home run, but it just barely goes over the wall. So 
Robinson has basically got, it's got a lot of height and Frank Robinson has his back to the wall as that ball just barely goes over his head. And just before the camera goes away, you can see Frank Robinson tip his cap, mm. a subtle little thing, but it says so much about the professionalism that was just so good in that era, in that era of baseball. But R Robinson, Clemente homers over the head of Frank Robinson and just very subtle little thing that says so much, the tip of the cap by two right fielders uh, in that same frame. I just, I had to bring that up because yeah. it was, it was one of those magic moments that I look back on of all the excitement. It doesn't get much play, uh, uh, but it's, it's, it's a, it's a nugget. It's one of those chestnuts. Yeah. I have to tell you about one play. I have to tell you what one play that Roberto did not make in the seventh game. And uh, it's an interesting one because I think it's Elrod Hendricks hits a gap shot to right center field and Roberto cuts across a little bit underneath and Gene Kleins, our center fielder is in back. Roberto is not able to stretch out and get the ball, but Kleins reaches up bare hands and turns it from a triple into a double. And, set to, and that's in a two to one seventh game of the World Series. And I, I do remember that play because I want to give Gene Kleins a lot of credit, the late Gene Kleins, who just died not too long ago. Uh, but it was just, it's, it's just one of those, because you, you're not used to seeing him make any mistakes out there. He made one and, and Kleins picked him up on it. And that, a big deal in that seventh game. I'm glad you mentioned Gene Kleins for a number of reasons. We had Gene on this program about a year ago to talk about the black, all black lineup, September 1st, 1971. And he was so great to talk to. I, I didn't know that he was ill at the time and he did end up passing away over the winter, but uh, we have great memories of Gene Kleins as Good well. Good One job. other play from the series, Steve, was the comebacker that Clemente hits to Mike Cuellar, <laughs> which looks like a routine out, but Clemente really busts out of the batter's box kind of forces Cuellar to hurry and make a bad throw. And that, that ignited a key rally. A lot of people forget about that. Yep. Yep. It just, it, 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 we have seen so much of that, but for the, for the national audience to see that is absolutely fabulous because uh, the, the great thing is about somebody who is giving hundred percent all the time. And and uh, all every every minute, and and that was the essence of Clemente. And you know, it didn't jog. Uh, you know, a two hopper back to the pitcher. Uh, if you're watching on television, you hardly see the batter in in the frame when the pitcher makes the play. Clemente was not only in the frame; he's got arms flapping and everything, and he's digging. He's digging for first base. Pulls Boog Powell straight up in the air. Yeah. He kind of slides. It runs in under him, and he he's, he ruled to be safe. And yeah, you don't know what's going to open the door. That opened the door. World Series, it's, it's, it's all on all the time. It's on. Yeah. It's on. And, and so is Clemente. He was on that whole led, series. Led to a three-run rally. The Pirates needed that game. And I believe they tied the series at 2-2 two to two with that victory. Yeah, that was the first night game, I think. First World Series night no, game. No, that, that actually, um, the night game, I think, was before. Um, but the, um, well, was, I'm not sure of the order. Yeah. I know the Clemente play was in the daytime, um, but the night game was. Um, yeah, yeah, the yes, that was the Nellie Bryles uh, game five, I think. Yeah. 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 So, uh, anyway, we thought, so we're going yeah. to get away from Clemente for just a moment. I love this photograph after Jackie Hernandez <laughs> goes behind the second base bag, makes a nice play on the Merv Rettenman grounder, throws a strike to Bob Robertson. You can see Robertson with his two hands straight up in the air. And then you uh, auditioning for the high jump in the Olympics. I've never seen a baseball player that high off the ground. Well, you know, uh, you never know what you're going to do after the last out of a World Series. But I'd, I'd won World Series games in my backyard in Connecticut when I was throwing a ball against the barn. So I was. I was <laughs> uh, but it, it, the thing was, I, I, I remember the play so vividly because I didn't know Jackie Hernandez was shaded up and, and back up uh, second base. So the ball goes by me, hits off the side of the mound, which turns it back toward Jackie a little bit. So he takes a big bounce, uh, chest high. And so I, as the ball's going by me, I'm saying, well, here comes Dave Jesse, the closer with, with that run. That, that's going to be a base hit. Yeah. And then I turn around, I see Jackie, and I, I, all I could do is holler, catch it. And he caught it. And I said, throw it. 
<laughs> and he threw it and I turned around to Bob Robertson and said, now you catch it. And he did. And the release is incredible. Absolutely incredible release of, of every emotion because you're so focused and so concentrating and so locked in that, yeah, I, I couldn't help myself. I, I ran toward Bob Robertson and I remember two words on the way over. That's all the time there was. for It's forever. We're the world champion. You know, I can... I can elongate it now, but it's forever. That's all I can think, those two, those two words, uh, because it, that's the dream. That's the dream and it's forever for that one shining moment. And, uh, you know, you sometimes think what you're gonna do, but you don't know what you're gonna do because it's such a release and uh, it's unbelievable. Finished off a two to one complete game victory. I'm not sure how many pitches you threw that day, but was probably in the vicinity of 100 or more, but not a lot of thought given to going to the bullpen. That's how good you were against the Orioles that day. Post-game clubhouse, here's the great photo, and you've called this your favorite photo of you and Roberto. Uh, you're in the locker at Memorial Stadium in the clubhouse, and the just beaming, genuine smiles. There's nothing posed about this. Oh, it, it's, a, it's, it's my favorite, my favorite picture. Um, to have him with his arm around my shoulder, I get goose. I'm, I got goosebumps right now. It's, it's just, uh, it's, 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 it's hard to even think that you, you can't dream something like that. That thing just, it just happens, and uh, um, just, it's, it's so wonderful. And, and uh, I know we're going to talk about being up on the podium uh, after that last game, but uh, I, I'm just going to go fast forward because. In the airplane, in the airplane, waiting to take off from Baltimore, Karen and I are sitting back at the plane. Roberto and Vera are up in front. And before we take off, he gets out of his seat. I'm by a window next to Karen. And he comes down the aisle of the airplane and he says, Blast, come out here and let me embrace you. I know that quote. I'll, I remember the words exactly. And I would have climbed over six elephants to get to him. And I just hung on. I didn't say a word. I just hung on to him. And I will never forget that the rest of my life. And I want to say that, well, we've got that picture in the frame because uh, the stuff on the podium is, 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 is great in its own way. But uh, to think I, I, you know, those planets aligning again from yeah. a kid from Falls Village, Connecticut, and another kid from Carolina, Puerto Rico, getting together for that, for that thing, that wonderful thing right there that we're looking at. Yeah. Steve, before but I ask the, my last question, I'm just going to ask you to move a little bit to your left. We're starting to lose you a little bit off the edge of the screen. Yeah. So there you go. Okay. I, you. I didn't, I didn't want to block out the picture of him in the back of me. Yeah. You talked <laughs> about the podium. Uh, you and Clemente are being interviewed by Bob Prince. Prince asked Clemente a question, but the first thing that Roberto does, he greets his parents who are not at the game. They're watching in their native homeland, Puerto Rico. And he actually delivers a message to them in Spanish. I don't know if that ever had been done in a World Series clubhouse. And that happened right in front of you. Yep. Yep. It did. Uh, Bob, Bob talked to me and then he's talking to Roberto. And, and I, I, I know I played in the Dominican Republic one winter. So I, I know some of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Spanish to get by. And I know he was addressing his parents. And I couldn't help myself when he got through and said, and Mr. And Mrs. Clemente, we love him too. And I was embarrassed about that for a lot of years, but then I said, no, I'm not embarrassed because that came from the heart. I, it came from the heart. So I feel okay about it. I probably shouldn't have interrupted him, but uh, the, technically, but uh, yeah, I, I just, I had to do, I, it just came out. I, 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 it just came out. And uh, to hear, see that, that was the class of him rather than talk about what he did on the baseball field, yeah. he addressed his parents before he talked about playing the game of baseball. That's, that's another part of the essence of, of a Roberto Clemente. Uh, he, he never lost track of, he doesn't lose track about the things that are, that are more important. He's so much aware of the world around him, his family. And uh, it's just, uh, it's just, it was just him. It was just him. It was, it, it was not surprising when I look back that he addressed his family first. For what it's worth, I thought what you said was great because it tinged a little bit of humor with um, really your sincere uh, love and admiration for Clemente and how he was regarded in that pirate clubhouse. So uh, I don't think there's any reason to feel uh, embarrassment for that. No. I thought it was terrific. Um, after the 71 series, milestone on an individual basis, 
September 30th, 1972. We're coming up on the 50th anniversary of this. Hit number 3,000. It happened at Three Rivers Stadium. Not a very big crowd, uh, but you were there that day. What uh, memories do you have of this milestone event? Well, for, we're playing the Mets, and uh, the night before, we thought he had gotten it, uh, a Friday night. So uh, we, uh, the official scorer, Luke Quay of the McKeesport Daily News, was the official scorer, and we thought he had the base hit. It was ruled an error, so so now uh, Friday is gone, and, and it's Saturday, and it's going to be the Mets. And John Matlack, who I still think in my mind is a very underrated pitcher uh, because of Seaver and Kuzman, who are great, great, great. But Matlack was a terrific pitcher. And uh, he hits the double to left center field. The, the Mets are there. Willie Mays is now with the Mets back in New York. And uh, as the ball leaves the bat, you know, because we have an angle. We were sitting in the first base dugout. You have an angle. The ball leaves the bat. You know it's left center. It's, it's two bases. You just know. And he, we, so you watch every step he takes. He rounds first, gets to second base. And to me, the most iconic picture of him by himself is when he's got one foot on the base, he's doffing his bag and helmet. And I think uh, that, I, I keep using the essence of Clemente, but that, that's, that's probably my favorite uh, rendering of, 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 that, uh, of that moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just so great. And they stopped the game, of course. Mays comes over from the first base, of, of the third base dugout. And uh, uh, that was a great scene with, with Willie Mays and, and Roberto Clemente. But uh, so, so happy again to see these milestones of his and uh, just, just be there. And, and we knew it was going to happen. And uh, Bill Verdon said, that's it. That's it. He's got to 3,000. We're going to get ready for postseason. And uh, it, 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 was just, it was a moment. It, it was a moment in Pittsburgh. Uh, and uh, it, it, we, won't, we won't forget it. Uh, the iconic moments uh, of, of, of that, the iconic iconic moments of we when we hear he, he's dead he's he gone in a plane crash uh, when I thought the the shoulders of the city of Pittsburgh slumped mm -hmm. later on but I, I love that picture of him doffing the, the batting helmet with one foot just elevated a little bit yeah. and the absolute expression of dignity on his face yeah. simple as that inside the helmet he wore his baseball cap he typically did that when he batted yeah. And that is the cap that you see on the right. That's part of our collection. And I photographed that here in, in this room, the Bud Selig Center, a couple of years ago. So that's the cap that's lodged inside the helmet. Yeah. And that was how Clemente typically batted. Yeah, that's, yeah, absolutely right. Of course, just a few months later, the absolute tragedy, stunning to pretty much everybody in the baseball world and certainly anyone close to the Clemente family, the tragedy of New Year's Eve, 1972. You end up delivering the eulogy at his funeral. And I understand it was terrific, although there's no recording of it. Was this something that his widow Vera had asked you to do or did somebody else approach you? How'd that come about? Well, we, uh, first of all, we, uh, we, Dave, Justy and I helped uh, with a list of, of uh, people who were gonna go down the charter on, on that. Uh, 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 to the memorial. Uh, our PR guy, Bill Guilfoyle, um, a great man. We, we all know about him and, and his involvement with, with, with the hall. And, and he had worked for the New York Yankees. And Bill approached the Yankees to ask them if, if the Pirates could paraphrase the Lou Gehrig eulogy and use it for Roberto Clemente. And the Yankees gave permission. So there, I think there were a couple of words that were changed. And uh, and uh, Bill came to me and, and said, we have this uh, eulogy and we'd like to know if, if you would read it. And I would say, and I said, it, it's an absolute honor. It's, it's an honor I don't want <laughs> uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, I would love to give the eulogy for Roberto Clement 20 years after that or 40 years or whatever it would be. Uh, so it, it was an unbelievable honor to, uh, to read that. And, uh, I, I have a, a plaque with it that, that hangs in my house and uh, in our apartment. And uh, I, I didn't know if I could get through it because I walked up through the aisle of the church in Carolina and I was shaking. I, I was shaking. Uh, and uh, 
it, uh, I, I got through it just barely uh, emotionally. And I go down now, I, I help give tours in the Clemente Museum. And I always finish up reading that eulogy. I take my plaque off the wall and I, I take it down to the museum. And, uh, and uh, I, I, I always get emotional when I, when I read it. And uh, that, that, that has never changed. And uh, the, the last words on it from your, from your friends on the pirate team. And it just goes chapter, you know, it's only two or three, four par paragraphs. But uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm glad I had a chance to do it. I wish it had been a lot later. Here are the last four lines. Uh, Let this be a silent token of lasting friendships gleam and all that we've left unspoken, your friends, friends and the, the pirate, pirate team. team. Yep. And that's what you delivered uh, so beautifully, yep. uh, among uh, other words, back in 72. It's amazing that um, I've heard it's a great talk. It was a great eulogy. And uh, it's remarkable that you were able to get through it as well as you did. Uh, yep. really and, and Bruce, one other thing too, uh, on, on the night uh, we, we got the news, uh, we were having a New Year's Eve party in, uh, at my house in, in the suburbs of, of, uh, of Pittsburgh in the South Hills. And Dave Justy, our, our great closer, who by the way, in that series uh, and, and postseason, pitched 10 pre pressure, pressure innings without giving up a run. I just want to give Dave props. Dave and his wife uh, stayed at our house. They came down. They just lived four houses away, but they stayed over. So they're in a bedroom down the hall from us. Bill Guilfoyle called at four o'clock in the morning and said, Steve, there's been an unconfirmed report that Clemente died in a plane crash tonight. And there weren't the 24 hour news loops that there are now. And there was not gonna be no more sleep. I went and got David. I said, David, you gotta you got wake up. Uh, and and we didn't know what to do other than we got up and, and made coffee. And then as soon as it got late, we drove over to Joe Brown, the GM's house. Uh, and, and we sat there because nothing was confirmed, no details. And so we didn't have a lot of information and neither did Joe. So we left Joe's house and we went over to Willie Stargell's house because we didn't know where to go. We didn't know what to do other than uh, we, we didn't know what to do. So we went over and spent the rest of the morning at, at Willie's house. And then uh, when confirmation came in, as I said earlier, I felt like the shoulders of the uh, city of Pittsburgh slumped. Uh, how, could, how could that happen? And, and the thing is, Bruce too, that was, that was a horrible awareness, uh, chapter one. Then you go to spring training later on and it, and it comes to you again, Clemente is not there for the first time in forever. So it hits you again, that's chapter two. And then when you come up to start the season, Clemente is not there again, it, it hits you a third time. So it was getting hit in the gut three times. And the actual announcement of his death and then spring training and then come to Pittsburgh and open the season without him. Uh, I'll never forget that sequence because it almost seemed like it was three days in a row when I look back on it. Yeah. But uh, it's uh, it, it, that that sense will never go away. I mean, because he was he was that big. He was that big. You see the photo here of you in 1973 wearing the number 21 patch. Yeah. All the pirate players, uh, the coaches, the manager, all wore that throughout the season in uh, in memory of Clemente. Steve, final question. Uh, thinking back to Clemente, his legacy. You know, it's 50 years since he passed away. But he's still well known today by a lot of kids who never saw him play. For those younger generations who didn't see him play, maybe haven't seen a lot of interviews that he did, there's only a few that are out there. What should those younger fans, those younger generations, what's the most important thing for them to know about Roberto Clemente? Two things that he was an absolutely gifted ball player that did have a sense of the world around him and not just the world of baseball, that you could, you could combine those two factors that, uh, that he didn't lose himself in, in, in this game that, that is played now. Uh, the game didn't own him. Uh, I think the world owned him uh, and he was aware of that world. And, you know, when they teach the kids in, in school and, uh, and uh, you know, there's a park named after him or a street or a playground or, 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 or whatever. Uh, I, I know great players, you know, the, the Mandels and the Mays and all those great players who've had great legacies. And I respect that. I don't know if they can't have that one issue of dying, being uh, involved in a humanitarian uh, mission. Uh, 
that can't be added to a legacy. And I think that's probably what set, sets him apart because the legacy doesn't go away. Every year there's a documentary or film or, or what we're doing now every, every year. And uh, so here was a person who could be a great athlete and a great individual. I, I think that's, that's what the kids need, need to do. And, uh, uh, and, and, and I, I, I go back and I, I go back to the kids. When you talk about the kids, when a kid would walk into the clubhouse and I, I like to use the phrase, it only takes a minute to make a moment. Mm. And Clemente was able to take a minute with a kid and make a moment that kid will never forget. Wonderfully said, Steve. Uh, this has been great over this past hour talking to you about your good friend, uh, teammate, Roberto Clemente. We thank you for that. We congratulate you on your well-deserved honor as a member of the new Pirates Hall of Fame. And uh, hey, I hope to see you up in, in, in Cooperstown. I hope you can make it up here at some point in the near future and we'll perhaps have a chance to talk again in a less formal way, but this has been excellent. Thank you, Steve. My pleasure, Bruce. I enjoyed the visit so much. And uh, I do, I do, I'm very proud. I have that 800 number. If somebody wants to talk to Clemente, I'm available <laughs> any, anytime, anyway. But thanks, I, I enjoyed the hour. Thank you, Steve. Steve Blass, uh, former standout with the Pirates, beloved broadcaster, member of their Hall of Fame, talking about Roberto Clemente on Roberto Clemente Day in 2022. We thank Steve. We also thank all of you for joining us for this special virtual Voices of the Game program. Thanks for being with us. Have a great day, everyone. Take care.